I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. If we could get this meeting to order, Representative Eckert, if you could lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. All right, if the members could introduce themselves. Chairman Dunbar, we'll start with you. Thank you, Chairman Dunbar, um, 56th District, Westmoreland County. Thank you all for being here. Morning, Joe DiOrsi, 47th District, York County. Josh Kale, uh, Beaver, Washington Counties. Russ Diamond, 102nd District, Lebanon County, and Chairman of the Republican Chairman of the Gaming Oversight Committee. Good morning, I'm John Schlegel, representing the 101st District in the heart of Lebanon County. Good morning, Torin Ecker, represent parts of Adams and Cumberland County. Eric Devanzo, 58th District, the best part of Westmoreland County. <laughs> Greg Williams, Chester, Delaware County. Jill Cooper, District 55, the other best part of Westmoreland <laughs> County. Jamie Flick, 83rd District, Lycoming County and Union County. Good morning, Don Oberlander. I represent the 63rd, which is all of Clarion and part of Armstrong. Kristen Marcel, 178th District, Bucks County. And we might also have members coming on online. Uh, it's less uh, usual when we are in Harrisburg, but it still is possible. And we will have members coming in as we go. Obviously, it's a busy day here in Harrisburg. Uh, so people will be coming and going, um, uh, asking questions. Uh, this hearing, this topic came at the suggestion of uh, Chairman Diamond. So Chairman Diamond, if you would like to uh, give us a brief introduction, give us a little bit of an opening remark, and we'll go from there. Sure. The topic of our topic of our conversation today is going to be skill games and how or and how we're going to regulate them in Pennsylvania. Look, I have been anxious to have this conversation for a very, very long time. I've served as a member of the Gaming Oversight Committee in my entire uh, five terms here in Harrisburg, and I'm now the Republican chairman. Sadly, uh, our Democrat uh, uh, compatriots have not called a single hearing of the Gaming Oversight Committee, and you know, unfortunately, we're kind of like the. Uh, the tail that gets wagged by the dog. So I'm glad that we're here today. Uh, and I want to thank all the members for attending because this is a hot topic in Pennsylvania. And with the governor's, with the governor's mention of this topic in his budget address, it is now not a matter of whether, uh, if we're going to regulate and tax skill games, it's a matter of how and when. Uh, I, I think the time is now. I certainly hope that we can get something done this session um, but as time goes on, you know how things work here in Harrisburg. But uh, I'm glad to have this opportunity to hear from some of the folks who represent uh, the folks who are benefiting and, and operating skill games in Pennsylvania. I think the question of their legality is beyond question now. Uh, the courts have ruled that way, and it's time for us to actually take some action. So I'm glad to have this conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your leadership on this issue. I'd like to echo a lot of what you did say on these gaming issues. What we are finding is there's a lot of uh, difference of opinions based off of regions. It's not so much of a political issue uh, as much as it is about regional focus and really what's happening in our districts. Because you have places like my district uh, that have games of skill uh, in the local VFWs, in the local gas stations, in the local delis, and it helps. It helps pay rent. It helps get through certain, uh, you know, tough times in different uh, economies, and um, and then you have other places where they're just not as familiar with it. So I think really. Uh, a part of this is educating. I think there's a place that we can land on these issues on gaming uh, that makes sense across the board uh, in industries, but it's going to take education. So we want to make sure that we are educating uh, members. And with uh, the governor coming out, like you said, um, with the governor coming out uh, raising the issue, this is going to be something that we are going to be talking about. And it's very unfortunate that the actual committee uh, has not met on, on this when you have such a, a massive issue. Um, but 
that's okay because we're willing to lead on it. We're willing, willing to uh, hear from stakeholders on it and, and get good perspective so that we're informed to make a decision. So today we have three testifiers joining us. All will share insights in the skill games and their impacts on our businesses, communities, and the Commonwealth. Um, if each testifier could keep their testimony to three to five minutes, I've never gaveled anybody out, <laughs> so I'm not going to hold you to it, but if you could keep within that range, that would be great. Um, and the testifiers here today is uh, Michael Barley, the Chief Public Affairs Officer of Pace Maddox Incorporated, Jim Delicio, the Vice President of Pennsylvania Licensed Beverage and Taverns Association, and Commander Stephen Holmes. Mr. Barley, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, members uh, and the staff for inviting me to be here this morning. Uh, as the Chairman said, my name is Mike Barley. I'm the Chief Public Affairs Officer for pace uh, the company that provides software for Pennsylvania skill games. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak to the committee today about skill games and why we support House Bill 2075, sponsored by Representative Danilo Burgos, co-sponsored by many of the GO members of the GOP caucus, and its companion, uh, Senate Bill 706, sponsored by Senator Gene Yaw. Both bills have solid bipartisan support. Uh, joining me today is uh, Stephen Holmes, commander of the American Legion, post 733, located just a few miles from the Capitol. He will share with you the perspective of the location that benefits from legal skill games. Let me open by saying the proposed skill game legislation is good for Pennsylvania, small businesses and fraternal clubs. It will rid the state of tens of thousands of illegal games and mini casinos blighting our communities. The legislation would also create $300 million in annually in additional tax revenue. I could spend my entire time this morning sharing stories about the positive impact legal skill games have on the Commonwealth. Uh, I could talk in detail about the restaurant that keeps its hardworking staff by offering higher wages and a 401k plan through skill game revenue, or the American Legion Post that can stay open because of skill games. The bar owner owned by the same family for 80 years that would never have made it through COVID if not for skill games and the volunteer fire companies that purchase life-saving equipment with their skill game revenue. Instead, I will tell you why regulating and taxing skill games makes sense for Pennsylvania. First, a reminder, Pennsylvania skill games are entirely legal. For 10 years, we have been receiving positive court decisions highlighting this point. The first was in 2014 in the Beaver County Court of Common Pleas, and the last was in November of this past year, 2023, when a unanimous Commonwealth Court ruled our games are legal. Second, a reminder about taxes. We already pay tens of millions of dollars in taxes from Pesomatic, our manufacturer, our operators, our locations, and our suppliers. We pay property, sales, income, and all other applicable taxes related to the industry and the business. We're the first to say regulation is necessary. We can all agree that a standard system and guardrails should be in place for operating skill games in Pennsylvania. As I mentioned, the state is littered with illegal slot machines that require no skill, yet they masquerade as skill games. The state has also seen a proliferation of mini casinos pop up around the Commonwealth. These are the once vacant storefronts and strip malls that now advertise themselves as casinos, hosting dozens of illegal games while conducting no other business. Pennsylvania skill already imposes strict limits on, number of on the number of games per location. That's why we support proposed legislation which states a small business may have up to five skill games and veteran and other fraternal clubs can have up to 10. Regulation also means that, like the Pennsylvania Lottery, the games will be overseen by the Department of Revenue. The state will have a complete list of where the games are located and be able to track game systems and play, something I know is important to lawmakers as well as the public. Also under regulation, we'll see the standardized enforcement. The state will have the means to shut down thousands of illegal games all over Pennsylvania and make sure everyone adheres to the same rules. This is nothing new for Pennsylvania skill. We have compliance agents, all former law enforcement who make sure locations follow our rules and self-imposed code of conduct. We have stopped working with operators and locations who don't follow our rules. Additionally, it's projected, as I said before, the state will receive 300 million in new revenue in the first year by taxing skill games, which could increase as the market stabilizes and matures. I would note that this is recurring state tax revenue that can be collected today. We believe, however, that a lower tax rate than what the governor proposed will garner higher revenue. If the tax is too high, many locations will decide to remove their games and some may even install legal games. This will defeat the purpose of the legislation. We all witnessed the devastating result of overtaxation and regulation with the Small Games of Chance bill a decade ago. We also hear the cries from the casinos when they claim that skill games impede on their markets. Research shows that's not the case. 
they are different player experiences. Second, the casino, in casino industry continues to break its revenue records, even as the legal skill game industry grows. I'd like to remind you that Pennsylvania is the second leading state for casino revenue in the country. I also want to specifically dispel one false talking point that is being bannered around this building. Slot machine revenue is not down. It's 4% higher year over year. Additionally, online gaming revenue is up 40%. Casinos are actively incentivizing their brick and mortar slot machine players to play online. There's nothing wrong with that. It's smart business. The tax rate for many games online is slower than traditional slot machines. But to assert skill games have a negative impact is just false. The lottery has also broken records and our research shows that lottery revenues increases in counties with more skill games. The other positive outcome of skill games is they are, the games are manufactured in Pennsylvania at Mealy Manufacturing in Williamsport. The company uses numerous Pennsylvania suppliers for wood, metal, glass, screws, shipping, and more. In fact, over 90% of the revenue generated from skill games, our Pennsylvania skill games, stay right here in the Commonwealth. We would all agree that manufacturing is crucial to a healthy state economy and our games have enabled employment growth and increased demand for supply. Finally, we encourage you to pass legislation that would regulate this industry, apply additional taxes to skill games, and implement strong enforcement measures. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Barley. We've also had a, a number of reps join us here since uh, we got in here. Representative Marcel, Representative Brown, Representative uh, Ro Roy, excuse me, I'm sorry, Chairman Roy, excuse me. Representative Kephart, Representative Rigby, um, and I also have four special guests with me over here <laughs> in, in the bullpen, uh, four, four of my children, not yet. Um, uh, you have Eli, Annika, Cleo, and, and Manny. So, <laughs> all right, Mr. Delicia. Chairman Kale, Representative Diamond, members of the committee, good morning. I'm Jim Delicio. I'm the owner of the Racehorse Tavern in Thomasville, York County. I'm also vice president of the Pennsylvania Licensed Beverage and Tavern Association, as well as president of the York County Tavern Association. With me is Chuck Moran, executive director of the Pennsylvania Licensed Beverage and Tavern Association. Chuck will be available to help answer questions afterwards. Let me begin by thanking you for inviting me and the Pennsylvania Licensed Beverage and Tavern Association to testify today. In the past, I've enjoyed speaking with this committee on other issues, so I am humbled to be asked to be invited back. Today we were talking about gaming and taverns with an emphasis on skill games. Gaming in general is a hot topic that I've testified in front of other committees before in recent years. And I want everyone here to know that my establishment is one of the few Pennsylvania bars that actively have a tavern gaming license. In fact, a license search conducted on March 11th, 2024 shows there are only 39 of us in the state. For the sake of comparison, the most recent annual report of the PLCB shows that there are slightly more than 11,200 R and H licenses in the state that could be eligible for tavern gaming license. If you do the math, that's about one third of 1% that has a license. As a background, the Pennsylvania Licensed Beverage and Tavern Association was established in 1941 and today represents small businesses, bars, taverns, and licensed restaurants throughout the state. Our perspective comes from the so-called mom and pop shops businesses that own either R, H, or E licenses. For the most part, we are your local bars, taverns, pubs, and licensed restaurants. We do not actively recruit large chains, grocery stores, or convenience stores that have our licenses. Based on past membership studies, about 63% of our members' businesses alcohol sales, and about 37% are from food. Our average member employs about 16 individuals, including the owners and family members. They serve less than 4,000 customers every month. If you count the chairs and bar stools throughout my member's establishment, you find less than 100 per establishment. The Tavern Association has a general position on gaming. We believe our members should be allowed to offer legal forms of gaming in their establishment to entertain their patrons. That extent comes from tavern gamings to other forms of gambling, including VGTs and video skill games. As you know, small businesses and bars have been hit really hard about the past eight years. Our financial struggles began in 2017 when Act 166 of 216 officially went into effect. That act stole executive rights that bar owners had to, se to sell six packs and growlers to go. Act 166 gave beer distributors the right to sell to consumers any amount of alcohol below a case and down to a growler. That combination and with other alcohol sales drove 
through Act 39 drove a stake through the heart of small businesses and bars. Our membership studies show that during that time, 85% of our members saw a decrease in beer sales and 30% of our members saw a decrease between 11 and 20%. That adds up to thousands of dollars of lost revenue every month. Clearly, small businesses and bars became collateral damage of Act 39 and 166. We know that it was not the intent of the legislature when it passed these bills, and Governor Wolf signed them into law. But you need to know that past legislative action seriously damaged small businesses and bars across the state, and we hope to work with you to correct this situation. With revenue dropping as a result of those acts, bar owners began to look at other options to fill their income voids and stay profitable. Bars were locked out of the opportunity to have VGTs in their establishments when truck stops got them. So VGTs was not a legal option, although we wish that they were. That's when video skill games entered the picture, and at least for now, the court decisions have declared them not to be slot machines. I can't tell you how many skill games are in Pennsylvania bars at this time. That data is not something that we collect. Businesses that sell and distribute skill games should have data and know how many of them are in Pennsylvania. But I can tell you, based upon conversations that I've had with colleagues at other establishments across the state, skill games filled at least part of the void. Those skill games are being used to pay bills, upgrade establishments, complete newer licensing types, or other benefits to employees such as 401ks and health benefits which were not available before. We certainly hope this legislature will take action soon to finally put to bed this debate on whether or not skill games are legal and whether skill games and VGT should be in Pennsylvania bars. We do, however, need to remember lessons from the past, including those in tavern games, which I am a current owner of, and current situations with skill games. First, tavern gaming did not take off and did not generate the revenue that the state projected. As mentioned earlier, a shockingly no number of licensed establishments chose to offer gaming. Why? There's little profit after taxes and payment of supplies. I can talk more about that during Q&A. Any less legislation that you would write to allow skill games and VGTs in bars would need to be carefully, uh, would need to be careful not to carry out a high tax. Also, there can't be a small cut for bars. Second, the current distribution of skill games is questionable. Unlike VGTs and truck stops that are regulated and monitored, skill game distributors have put their machines in locations that are easily accessible to anyone, including minors. There are also issues related to security and safety of some locations where these machines have been placed. You probably saw recent articles out of Philadelphia that indicate the city has taken initial steps to ban skill games. Apparently, players are being robbed after winning and leaving the establishments. I conclude by thanking you for the opportunity to represent small businesses, taverns, and licensed restaurants today. Chuck and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time or in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I did fail to mention Representative McKenzie is here as well. I, there's also others that I'm going to forget, and I apologize in advance. There's just a lot of in and out. So, Mr. Holmes. Good morning, committee members. It is my pleasure to be here today to speak on all about the skilled games. My name is Stephen Holmes. I'm the commander of, a, of a Ephraim Slaughter American Legion Post 733 in Harrisburg. As Mike mentioned, I am located just a few short miles from where we are. I want you to know that skill games have made a huge difference in my post. I don't know what we would have done without them. First, let me tell you a little about our organization. I am honored to command the American Legion Post located on State Street. Our members are dedicated to the veterans and community. We take pride in the work that we do. For example, the upkeep, uh, um, the, the upkeep of our doors, the upkeep of our facilities, our doors are open every day of the year. We don't want a veteran ever to be in distress and not have a place to go. Not that long ago, a homeless veteran showed up at our doors, at our footstep, and we made sure that he received the food assistance, the financial assistance in order to keep him on the go. At any other time, any member of our association will be there. We've had members that have been in the hospital fall short on funds, and American Legion stepped up and made sure that we did the best that we could to, in order to make sure that they secured the funds and assistance that they need. Our goal is to try to make, take care of the veterans in any way that we can, and I mean any way that we can to help a vet. The American Legion and VFW pr provide a, a sort of a rest and recuperation stop for the veterans community, a safe place where they can go and enjoy the camaraderie and support among other veterans. 
They can share their experiences and sometimes difficult conversations with other veterans about the demons they face. I call it the smells of war. To be able to be able to go through some of the most horrific things in your life and not be able to break that down and share with somebody that has walked those grounds, that has smelled those smells before, to be able to express them and let them know it's going to be all right. The memories may not go away, but we will have somebody there to be able to break bread with you and understand the walk that you walk. Veterans have been through a lot. And I don't think I have to tell you that. They have been experienced most of the most horrific things in this world. And thank goodness for that, so that we have an organization that are there to take care of them. As you know, it's not just the post and, and our services we consider. We also worry about making ends meet financially. Like a lot of organizations, we struggle to find new members and face growing costs. It is hard for many American legions and VFW to keep their doors open. And by the way, there are over 900 uh, legions and VFW posts in the state of Pennsylvania that need support. That is why I'm so thankful for the Pennsylvania Skill Games. A lot of people will tell you that they do what, what they do with the revenue they receive from the Skill Games, and I will also. But I first want to ask you something. Where do you think our organizations would be at today without the skill games? How would Post 733 bring in the revenue we need to pay bills and to do what our community needs without skill games? Well, I'll tell you the answer, not nearly as much. And we've experienced that with the minimum of what we used to do before skill games came in. We were just doing the best that we could and sometimes it was just a sad situation not to be able to give the full support that you could give because our revenue and the monies that we have and our membership just weren't there. And there are veteran groups across the state that would have closed their doors if it weren't for the skill games. They never would have made it out of COVID. Our post took a huge financial hit because of the pandemic. Thankfully, we had skill games to fall back on. They make tremendous differences for us I would definitely scale back on what we would do without them. Skill games allow us to provide toys for top programs, community service programs. We have a program called Backpacks for PhDs in which we issued over 900 backpacks with quality materials to the children within our area. And they look forward to that every year. And that even takes a little bit away from the parents that have to spend money on these things for their children. We're there. We're the stopgap not just for veterans, for children also. For the games themselves, many members and guests in our post enjoy them. They have become a popular fixture in our place, an extra thing to do while they are there. Many American Legion and VFW count on skill games. They give us the ability and the resources and the organizations to help our veterans. We need to make sure that they don't go away. The impact would be devastating. And even with the skill games that we have, we have operators such as Progressive Progressive amusements, uh, uh, they are like a family. They take care of our equipment, they help us out. Anything that we need, they step up and help us. So it is a gigantic family. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Chairman Diamond. Thank you, gentlemen, all three of you for coming in. Uh, Mr. Delicio, I, we should have put a red carpet out uh, because you, I believe in my ten, nine years here, you're the first tavern game operator that I think I've met. So actually, uh, my executive director, Jen Weeder, who was here with us today, she mentioned Tavern Games to me the other day. I said, is that still a thing? Because that's how unpopular it was. Uh, Mr. Ho uh, Commander Holmes, I want to thank you for everything you do. And your story can be repeated hundreds of times over across the Commonwealth with these machines that have helped our, with a, the with a dismal rate of volunteerism these days. Really, this is really helping all our volunteer organizations. So thank you what you do. My question is for you, Mr. Barley. Um, you had mentioned illegal machines in, in your testimony, and I think that our members here would benefit from a little explanation as to what you mean by that, because we have your skill machines, which clearly the courts have said that these are legal things. Uh, are these illegal machines just slot machines that don't have any element of skill? Are they masquerading as skill games? Can you just give, uh, give us, a, the members, a little bit of uh, detail on that? Sure, and thanks, Chairman. The, the biggest difference between uh, a skill game and a, a game of chance is really 
the algorithm or the, the, the math behind it that says that you've played enough, you put enough money in the machine to win. So our games don't have that. You can win every single time. We don't have a compensating algorithm, and that is something the court has found and uh, uh, something that we believe needs to be part of the legislation to ensure that, that is, uh, these games do adhere to a skill factor. They are a predominant game of predominant skill. Uh, there are games out there, and I think, unfortunately, due to the litigation that's had to transpire throughout the, this uh, period of time to prove that our game was legal, I think law enforcement has unfortunately kind of been forced to throw up their hands. These cases are very expensive. You need experts in gaming to, to prosecute them. Uh, that's why I believe the legislature needs to get their hands around it. And I think obviously the work this committee is doing is part of that. Uh, to have a registry to ensure that these games are already uh, certified by the state, they know what they are, so you're not going through this la battle of is it a game of chance, is it a game of skill. But to your question, there are tens of thousands of illegal slot machines and VGTs out there that plaster skill games on the on the front and even include our court cases on the side. Yeah, so so in theory, or actually this is the way it's going to happen, is we regulate them, we regulate the skill games, and then they will have some sort of state seal on them or something like that, and law enforcement can tell the difference, right? And, and that's very important going forward. Yes, Chairman. Ideally, that you know, again, those those terminals are traced back to a database that shows that that from the state, controlled by the state, that shows that that terminal is where it's supposed to be, and, and all the statistics and everything behind it. Excellent. That's what we want. We don't want confused law enforcement. Thank you, Representative Brigby. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, General, for your testimonies, and Mr. Barley. The the PA Skills is a is a registered trademark from Pacematic, so um, my understanding is those machines are owned by you. The, the stores, the, the vendors don't own those machines. You own them so that if there is uh, some activities you don't care for in a store, you can remove them. Uh, is that correct? They're actually owned by the operators, the coin operator businesses around Pennsylvania. Many of them are multi-generational family businesses. Many of them are with me today. Um, uh, they own the machines, but we do have a mechanism to to shut the machines off. And the other question I had, I, I, a little bit familiar with your machines. Uh, Lady Periwinkle and the Bandito Brothers are my favorites. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, I noticed there's other machines. I've noticed when the, the PA Skills machines are in, now they're adding other machines beside them, which, which aren't your machines. And I'm just wondering if you, you know, appreciate that mix or you don't want them in mixed with yours. We have in Johnstown uh, some places called the Vault. They've opened up into old banks now. Uh, but when I've won in there, I've had to pay taxes on my winnings. When I win on a PA Skills, I can only get $500 on a strip at a time. Not that I win a lot of money, but that, that, that's how it works, correct? It, it comes out in $500 increments, so we don't hit that, that $599 where you'd pay a tax. Do you see that maybe down the road where that may have to change, that's, that we may have to to pay that tax. I mean, quite honestly, I enjoy keeping my money. Um, I don't want to give it to the state or the federal government, but some of these other places you do have to, I mean, they'll give you the form and you have to fill it out right there when you win. Um, and I'm just wondering as we're talking about moving forward and, and regulating this in the Commonwealth, do you think this is something that may come about? And I know a lot of your money goes back into the communities and that certainly would be a deterrent to that if, if it's going into taxes. So if you could just respond to that. Yeah, sure. So uh, the, the commingled locations, you know, the, the issue that we have is we indemnify our locations uh, to, uh, the, with the legality of our game. If there are other games in there, it's difficult for us to do that because we don't know if they're legal games, and oftentimes they're not. And uh, that is an issue that we face, and it's something, again, I think through the regulatory process will we'll eliminate that problem, right? If they're registered with the state, if they're tested by a third-party testing laboratory, we'll not have that issue. As for the taxing issue, it, it's difficult. We're not, a, you know, it's not a gaming, uh, it, we're not defined as gaming, gambling in the code. Um, but, you know, revenue, if you collect it, is supposed to be uh, reported by the person. So I think as we go through this process, that is something that can be addressed through regulation. Now, and it was interesting. We had, uh, they were in town last week at a few of the gas stations removing machines, uh, which my understanding is they're not supposed to do that, but, but they didn't touch any of the PA skills. Uh, they were in removing the other machines that aren't regulated. So I, I, I know that 
your machines are recognized here in the state. They, again, they removed a bunch of the other ones, never touched the PA skill. So I thank you for your testimony. And thank you for your machines. Thank you, Representative. Chairman Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and first off, good morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I do appreciate the fact that you're asking to be regulated and taxed and have been asking that for several years. And the fact that it's not done is not your fault. It is certainly ours. Uh, but it does seem to be an area and, and a, a direction we are going in. Uh, I'd just like to try to work through a few numbers with you, if we can, just to see if the governor's proposal is attainable or is too low or too high. Uh, with that being said, I'll use the term unregulated games, which includes your legal games and those illegal games that are out there. Do you have a general idea of how many unregulated games there are all in the Commonwealth? I guess I would disagree with the term unregulated for our games. The courts have ruled they're regulated. Are they regulated fully? No. And I regulated by the state. Let's use that. Um, the, we have 18,000 games in the market. Uh, I can only go with what we have a team of compliance officers. They go around and look. I can only say that if you're looking at you want to put the number 50 to 60,000, I think it's low. Okay, yeah, and actually the last report I read from the American Gaming Association pegged it at about 67,000. Would you say that's reasonable? I think it's probably higher than that, but okay. yeah, it's reasonable. that's fair. That's fair. Also in that same report from the AGA, they estimated annual revenues of these machines to be anywhere from 33,000 to 50,000 per machine on an annual basis. Is that realistic, high, low? It's realistic. It's based on Illinois numbers, which, you know. It, it really depends on location where you're at. Obviously, a game in Elk County is not going to earn what a game in Westmoreland County would. Exactly. And, and, and actually, what I'm trying to get at is if you would take the average annual profit per machine times how many machines and then the tax rate, you could figure out whether we're meeting the budget and numbers that we're trying to, to look at as well. Uh, you had also, Mr. Barley, you'd also mentioned a registry as far as machines. Do you have any objections for machines to being hardwired into the state? I think it depends on... The answer is no, but it depends on what that system is. A lot of times we get asked to be put into a SAS compliance system. SAS stands for slots accounting system. SAS does a number of things. It touches about a million different points uh, on a machine, including controlling the payout rate. Our games don't have a payout rate. So I think to your answer to answer the question, Representative, it would depend on if it's limited to, you know, certain things that our machines can do, cash in, cash out, things that the state would look to do, yes. It's similar to what BGTs have right now in the truck stops. Again, except for they're more Understood, slop understood machine. payback percentage. Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Delisio had mentioned also about uh, BGTs, that they have no problem with VGTs either. Do you have any objections to be treated at a level playing field with VGTs and compete with them, both in truck stops and taverns? Well, I think that's going to be a decision for the, for the legislature to make. I, you know, I think that... Uh, Again, I think that with the casino industry, I think there's always been some objection to having the same exact machine, and we see it out there with uh, even the illegals. You see a, a, the exact same machine that's on the casino floor uh, in a gas station or in another. So again, I think that's a decision that the legislature is going to have to make. And, and lastly, you had um, mentioned both House Bill 2075 and Senate Bill 706. I would also ask you to uh, peruse House Bill 2042 and give your comments on that, if you would. Uh, which does include level playing field and treating skill games the same as VGTs and level playing field, let everybody compete, which I am all for. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Schlegel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our testifiers for being here today. I appreciate your testimony, written and presentation today, very well done. Um, can't help but think that your responses to a number of my colleagues' questions today is, uh, is a good segue to, to, to my question. And as we consider evolving regulatory considerations in the gaming industry, I was wondering, um, are, are there other states and laws with regulations that Pennsylvania uh, could emulate? I'll take that, Representative. So uh, we're uh, there's currently various skill day game legis uh, legislation across this, the country. Wyoming uh, has uh, uh, a regulatory system specifically for skill games. Uh, 
And uh, Virginia has passed uh, regulations that's on the governor's desk right now, so we'll see what that comes up with. Those two are the, the larger states. We're also regulating the District of Columbia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, gentlemen. Now, I don't know a whole lot about this topic, so I, I do appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here today. But on a regular slot machine at a casino, it's a it's 100% random luck. You pull that lever down, or sometimes I think they just push a button. They don't even have to pull that big lever down. But it's 100% random luck. The skill games, there's some element of skill involved. Could, could you describe what that skill is? Like, like, and how much of it is random luck and how much of it is skill? Well, I, I think the, the answer is that every puzzle presents, uh, uh, every game presents you the opportunity to win. So, and that's a difference between a slot machine where, again, you, it's determined randomly on chance and, and really it's the compensating algorithm that drives it. Is it have you, has the player put enough money in or that player, it, it, throughout the whole system to push a win out? Our game doesn't have that. Our games go up, up and down. So the basic game for us is a, it's a tic-tac-toe style game. So you play, uh, sometimes you have no combination. It takes you to a, a, a secondary game, which is like Simon says. Uh, sometimes it, it throws you multiple combinations. The higher the prize, the, the quicker your reaction needs to be. Uh, so it, again, it's it, you can't just press a button a, a bunch of times and, and win. You actually have to interact with the machine. It's slower, takes more time, uh, and again, the big difference between our game and, a, and a, a slot machine is that that compensating algorithm. So, so, so like on on the skill game, like on a real slot machine at casino, there there's those I don't even know what you call them. Those wheels spin around, and they all stop on the same thing. You win. On the video screen of these skill games, there isn't anything like that? But again, the, the way that our games play, there isn't uh, all, the, all of the uh, animation, everything that goes into it, really, it, it could be similar. However, the, the real difference is that there just isn't this math equation that's saying you can win. Uh, we have games that go you know, thousands of dollars upside down. We have locations calling us saying, hey, get this thing out of here. It's, it's cost me money, but you have to kind of what go through players and players play differently. Um, uh, I, you know, one of the analogies I use, it's kind of like basketball. Every player, we're obviously all watching the tournament, or many of us are. Uh, different players have different abilities and some players play the game differently. Some player will uh, come across the half court line and chuck up a three, right? And some will go down for the layup. It just depends how you play. Some people play for more entertainment. Some people are playing it, hey, I'm gonna win every single time. I'm gonna play through every combination. It just depends on how they play. As far as the tax rate, I mean, I again, I really appreciate being here today. Part of me says, like, a lot of volunteer fire departments in our area, you know, they get a lot of their funding from the skill games, VFW posts, you know, build wheelchair ramps, you know, Elks Lodges donate to food pantries. So if the state takes a 10% cut or a 20% or 30%, 40 whatever the state ends up taking, that's less money locally supporting charity uh, and the state would have that money. Uh, uh, if we don't do anything at all, there wouldn't be that state tax, and all that money would continue to be local. So it's, it's, it's a really complex issue. So I, I, I do appreciate being here. But is, is any thoughts on how much this would hurt the finances of different clubs like Elks and VFW, fire departments, stuff like that, if, if you lost a certain percentage of your revenue? Uh, I, look, I, I can speak to the fact that I think the, the tax is uh, something that the legislature is going to have to determine. I think, you know, the reality is going to come out of a lot of these organizations and small businesses that are hurting. I think to uh, uh, have a fair tax rate is going to be important for this. I do think there needs to be money that's taken out for enforcement to make sure that the industry is playing by the rules and in within guardrails, uh, not only to ensure the integrity of the uh, industry, but also the safety of Pennsylvanians. Um, I'd like to add to that a little bit, being that I do have tavern gaming license. And what I can tell you is when they first came out with this, they were saying that it was going to generate 90 to $100 million to Pennsylvania. And I don't think it's doing $3 million. I don't know what it's doing, but it's not doing what they said. The reason is, 
the government decided that it would be in their best interest to tax our games at 65%. I have paperwork here that shows when I go to my gaming place to buy my games, a club, VFW or whatever, would pay $600 or whatever for their games. I pay 4000 And that money sits there. I can't get my revenue back until those games are played. In a VFW or a, a Legion, um, if those games aren't played because people talk, the big winners are out, um, they stop playing the game. They don't pay their tax until they're done with the game. I pay mine before I get the game. So the fact that the government stepped in and taxed these at a rate of 65% killed tavern gaming completely. If they legalize VGTs or skill games or whatever in Pennsylvania and take the same theory, you'll kill the skill game industry as well. Because people will not put them in their bars. They take up space and there's no revenue at the end of the day. And I just wanted to let you know that if we take that same path, we're gonna end up with the same result. Thank you. Representative Marcel. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm over here, I'm sorry, in the corner. Um, I had two questions. Uh, this is a topic I've been learning more about. Um, so I wanted first to ask, you know, so during recent uh, budget hearings, there are a number of agencies where we were asking questions about some of these new initiatives from the governor and I think I was hoping to just hear a little bit more from you about what are the what's the challenge of trying to regulate this. So there were questions that were asked of Governor Shapiro's um, agency leads for a number of his new initiatives, but just what are the challenges that we're facing as we're trying to look at trying to get this budget done by June 30th? Well, <laughs> I don't envy you guys with getting the budget done, so <laughs> I'll tackle the regulation of skill games, and I think the one thing that's difficult, and it's very, and it is, I, I, as someone who's been around Harrisburg and has been in this building, I, it's difficult sometimes to not get into this theory of we did it this way, so you got to do it this way because you got to fit a round peg and a round hole, and in this case, I think a square peg and a round hole. So when you look at gaming, how gaming has traditionally been done in, in Pennsylvania, we have an illegal product, we make it legal, we come up with a process, a regulation, a registration process. Then we issue licenses, and then we, we put them into the field. Uh, this industry, we're catching up. We have a legal product. It's all over the place. There's no guardrails established. I don't think you're going to be able to regulate this thing in one shot. I think it's going to have to be a process and an evolving process to get this thing under control and then begin to implement further regulation. And I think that's a different way of looking at this as opposed to other gaming. And I think the challenge for everyone is to think a little bit more outside the box and not just try to put it into, this is casino gambling, this is how we did it then. It's just a different, a different animal and, and really uh, the horse is out of the barn. Thank you. I also, um, unless anyone else wanted to add to that, um, I also was wondering just generally, you know, what strategies you guys employ to advertise and market? Like how do people know uh, that these machines are in different locations? I, honestly, I'm just asking because I don't, I don't know that much about this area. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I, one of the things, I don't advertise because here's the problem. Are they legal or aren't they legal? Are they gonna come take them or aren't they? I have a small games of chance license for my tavern. If by chance, my skill games are confiscated and the infraction sticks. When I go to renew my gaming license, they may say I have a gambling violation on my license, therefore they're not gonna renew my small games license, now I lose both. So I don't advertise and I don't know that anybody's advertising because we don't know, are they legal or aren't they? Are they gonna come take them or aren't they? Am I gonna be the guy they make an example out of? So. There is no advertising, which is a huge problem because the money generated could be even bigger if we were allowed to advertise and let people know, hey, they're legal and they are here and we are, you know, paying our fair share in taxes. So just as a follow-up, so would, do you, would you say then, do most people, do they find out word of mouth? Does someone, like, I'm just trying to find out 
Yeah, I mean, look, we have a legal product. I just established that again, and, it, and most of it's word of mouth. Um, we do limit, and I think you see in other states, they limit advertising for, for these games. And I think, you know, again, common sense things like, you know, uh, uh, not allowing businesses to advertise themselves as a casino, uh, things that would take away, and I, I do agree with the casino industry, that would, would conflate or confuse people into the two different uh, business. So most of our is worth it, word of mouth. They go in. I think it's it's also part of the model that we have. Our game's not meant to be the the, the driver of your income. It's meant to be a supplemental revenue piece. Uh, a lot of these coin operated machine uh, machine operators behind me, they've been providing supplemental revenue to these businesses for many generations. Whether it's pool tables, dartboards, the old coin. Uh, dispensers with the candy, those things, and, and obviously arcade games. Uh, the phone ruined arcade games, and uh, we often hear the, the joke that we're like the biggest thing since Ms. Ms. Pac-Man came around. So uh, the industry's changed, um, but these these games and these type of entertainments provided supplemental revenue for these businesses for years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Kephart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you guys for being here today. You know, um, back in my district, um, it's very rural. Uh, we don't have any casinos nearby. But I will tell you that, uh, you know, the people generally there have been, you know, supportive of this. For instance, um, I have a bar, a guy that owns a bar in Ebensburg, but he also owns a little, uh, it's like the only store in this little town of about 300 people, a town called Westover. You know, I was talking to him and he's like, you know, these things kept me afloat during COVID. Um, you know, and he said, I, you know, I renovated places, a guy that owns a, a breakfast place in one of my bigger towns, you know, he says it's allowed him to renovate his whole area. Um, but I want to touch on the, uh, the nonprofit sector here because um, every year I do uh, a speech on Memorial Day and Veterans Day at a VFW. And then if you go in the back, they have these skill games and they're basically telling you the same thing that you said, Commander. So I just want to uh, you know, further go into what you said earlier about what you were doing with this. Did you say, um, you know, those guys up there, the moose and stuff, you know, they sponsor a ball team. And the guys that run the moose basically said, you know, if you take these away, who are you hurting really? Because they're, you know, I mean, they're cashing in on some of these, but they're giving them back to the community. Could you further expand on, you know, what exactly you do with the revenue um, from skill games? Yes, sir. Uh, the revenue that we get from skill games, we support our community. As of today, uh, the Nativity School of Harrisburg and American Legion, we have one of the biggest scouting organizations in three counties. We have 60 brand new Boy Scouts that have come under our wing, and these children are coming from you know low incomes and you know not a lot of money. And we're supplying. We are. We are through the American Legion helping to supply the needs for the scout books, hopefully for the uniform. The actual price per child is about $1,200 per child to get them fully vetted uniforms and everything, and we support that. Uh, also, like when we were talking about some of the programs that we do, like the uh, backpack program, Toys for Tots, we had over 2,000 uh, toys that were, that were purchased and donated for the community, and these folks look for that every year because we give out quality materials and quality things and to give back as far as the American Legion is concerned in location. There is no place I know in America that does not want an American Legion in their, in their neighborhood. We set the example for, for, uh, for a, a, a building, the grounds. We set the example maybe if I'm next door to a, a property that is the American Legion and my place is looking a little rough, that may be a little incentive for you to rake your grass, I mean rake your grass or help. And we do that sometimes with the one building next to us if it looks a little ratty because it impacts us. So there are, there are a ton of things we, we do uh, to support our community and looking to do it more. And one of the things that I did say, without the skill games, I remember what it was like. I remember what it was like an Easter egg hunt in the back of the Legion where uh, the, it was just about the size of an uh, oversized backyard and we could only supply the Easter eggs and we had a line of kids out the door that was crazy. But this year, last year, 
we have the entire reservoir park on our side full of eggs. Whether that some of the eggs have candy, cash, or whatever, it is the biggest thing that we have, and it is this weekend if you like to come by. Yeah, so, I mean, just to follow up on this real quick, Chairman, um, you know, you know, the proposal is 42 percent. I mean, that is just very, very high in my opinion. And that, I mean, I, I, I couldn't support something like that because when I listen to people back home, I mean, they probably say, I mean, like I said, very rural. They're saying they potentially could lose their gains if they said it at that rate. What would the, I mean, in your opinion, what would be the effect of setting such a high rate? I don't know that much about the, the ins and outs of the tax rate of these things, but if we're, if we're overtaxed, what will be the, 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 the fallback for us, especially at the level that we're giving now? The only thing I can say is as a, uh, what, what we call as a nonprofit, just take a special look at us guys and just, just try to rationalize what would it be like to, to overtax us and look at what our giving is and what our abilities would be like if we're taxed at a rate that 40 whatever percent, I don't know the ins and outs of that, but I know overtaxation would be really rough on a nonprofit. Thank you. Representative Brown. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for testifying today. Um, this is a big deal in my district, and, and I agree with what you're saying in terms of supporting the businesses. Can you help me better understand the, the contractual agreement between the businesses and uh, the game provider? Sure. So, uh, you know, again, I can speak to what Pesomatics is. I can't speak to what everybody in the market <laughs> does. but. Um, the way we operate is we partner with a coin-operated business, the folks that provide your ATM, your pool table, those type of uh, products. Uh, they work with the location. Typically, they already have a relationship with them. Uh, and the way that the, our contract works, it's a 40% it's a split for the location with no capital outlay. The operator who's in charge of the maintenance, ensuring that it's the, the, the game is play, playable, clean, has cash, all that, they, they get 40%, and then we take a 20% for what we do in the market and everything else, including making sure that we have a, uh, a legal regulated product. And how does it work for the others? It, it depends. Um, some, and again, there is there is a number of illegal operations out there. Some just, uh, they they drop off the machine and they, they you know, it, it could be a, uh, some locations buy the machines themselves and it's 80% uh, split or however it works. It's really difficult to say. There's a lot of different things going on in the market. And you had said there's approximately 60,000 of those other types of games? Yes. Wow. Historically in Pennsylvania, and this is long before the skill game issue even came about, I mean, there's still one-armed bandits uh, with ballys written on the side of uh, games in in parts of Pennsylvania, and that's been a reality for decades. Okay, thank you. All right, anybody else have any questions before I turn it back over to the good chairman? Chairman Diamond. Uh, thank you, just just one issue that comes to mind. I, I sat down for a documentary interview with someone who was very concerned about problem gambling in Pennsylvania. There was a very disturbing article uh, that came out a couple weeks ago in Wall Street Journal uh, about some issues that are going on with problem gambling. Now, <clears throat> you are not gambling. I acknowledge that. And in fact, I just uh, asked uh, Jen Weider, our executive director, that all those, in anticipation of regulating you, we're going to change the names of all that stuff to problem gaming rather than gambling yeah, so that you can be included. So I wanted to ask you, um, are, are you willing to participate in any kind of problem gaming uh, programs and, and, and treatments and, and anything like that uh, at, at, if, if, if we do, in fact, regulate you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's got to be part of it, and, I, and we certainly would expect that some of the tax revenue would be going to help increase the funding for those organizations. All right, that's good. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for testifying. Thank you, members, for your insightful questions. I appreciate it. And I, I uh, actually, you have another question? I have a question, yeah. I just well, then I'll just sum up and shut up, and you can, yeah. you can finish. And I'll How's hand that? I'll back over to you. I'm no, sorry. you don't hand it. I'm done. <laughs> so, Ms. 
First off, I want to say thank you to Mr. Holmes for what you and your organization do. Um, it's inspiring to hear you talk today, the care that you have for your organization, for your community, the good work that your organization does. Thank you. We need more people like you doing what you're doing, and it's definitely appreciated. There was some mention earlier, uh, Representative Kebhart talked about uh, the tax rate, 42%. Uh, Mr. Delisio, I just have a question for you uh, on this because I think you, you have a pretty objective view uh, from your standpoint. You talked about earlier how, you know, uh, overregulation, taxes, stuff can really smother out uh, certain aspects of industry. And I, I can't remember the exact context of what you said, but how something was opened up and we just ended up destroying it, we being Harrisburg, um, I, I don't often like associating myself with it. So Harrisburg ended up uh, struggling out uh, the industry. Um, and then there was mention of the tax rate that was proposed by the governor, 42%. Is there a level where you would see that it would be acceptable and you wouldn't see a huge uh, problem for your members? Or um, have you guys gotten to that point? I'm curious to get your perspective on that. Uh, yeah. Um, so. I mean, obviously, like I said before, um, you know, the interpretation of the law as it's written is even vague because the law says that um, your net income should be 35 percent, but that's not how they do the math, and they do the math off the gross. To me, in my business, net is what I put in my pocket after everything is being spent. That's the way it should be, but it's not. So when I say 65 percent, and we're supposed to get 35%. In all actuality, we only end up with about 15% because they don't take into consideration the cost of the game, the cost of the equipment to run the game, all of those things. So at the end of the day, your net isn't even what the law says it's supposed to be. That's why we only have 39 people. So at 65%, obviously, there's over 11,000 bars and restaurants that could have gaming, and they don't because there's nothing left at the end of the day. So I think reasonably, you know, we should be right in around the 18 to 22 percent would be something that should be comfortable for the government to do what they need to do and leave something on the table for small businesses and this gentleman next to me doing things for the community. We all do things for the community. I mean, bars and restaurants. So I just think that you really need to be careful if this thing comes to fruition, how we tax this or you're going to kill it. Thank you. And, and thank you all for your testimony today. I, I, the, one of the very first meetings I took as a legislator uh, was uh, with a gentleman that, that operates uh, Games of Skill in my district. And he explained to me uh, how it impacts local businesses. One of the very first hearings um, that I attended as a freshman legislator was a gaming oversight hearing. I was a member at the time. Um, and this issue, since the beginning of of my tenure uh, has been a hot button issue and I don't see it changing uh, very much going into the future from that standpoint. I do think that there are issues that we can tackle and I think Mr. Barley, I think your comments about doing this incrementally, it's probably what's going to end up happening. Just my guess is how Harrisburg works. But there's definitely a place for everyone to come and get together and have a landing spot on these issues because we're here to solve problems and to do what's best for our constituents. And I think there's room uh, for that and for what we're trying to accomplish uh, in gaming. So I, I appreciate you all coming here to testify. The policy committee will um, soon be embarking on a dis series of hearings across the state to discuss consumer focused energy policy. March 28th, Thursday, will be in Luzerne County uh, with Representative Cabell. April 2nd, we'll be in Blair County with Representative Gregory. April 3rd, we'll be in Armstrong County with Representative Major. Until then, this committee is adjourned.